Mr. Logan, what do you have eyes on, sir? It's not live yet. It's just your all thing up there. It does say streaming to zero and stop streaming. I, I don't know why it says that. Yeah, it'll take just a second to catch up. Oh, mustard. Oh, sorry. Still nothing yet, Logan? No. Uh. Yeah, now it is. Yep, I see the one. All right. Well, hello, everybody. This is Proverbs Guy from the Proverbs Guy official YouTube channel. And we have your co-host and main host, Rosie B. Give us a wave, Rosie. We also have story time with Sarah. Sarah, how are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. And we have the famous, extraordinary gangster ghost, a.k.a. Mr. Logan, who is very YouTube popular. He is on almost every YouTube live streaming show that there is out there. And how he finds the time to do it, God bless him for it. Rosie, if it's okay with you, as this is your show, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so everybody can see the introduction video that you created. And they can kind of get a feel for where the heart of this stream is. And please give me grace because it's the first try. Yeah. All right, let's dive in. Sharing my screen and we are going for play. So everybody be on their best behavior and no talking during the video, please. Hi, and welcome to Pray Until Something Happens Push Podcast. I am your host, Rosie B. Our mission is to proclaim the gospel to a dying world, defend sound doctrine, discern counterfeits, equip the body of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, with the resources to defend the truth of the scriptures and reason with unbelievers with apologetics tactics in a loving and gentle, respectful way. Because of the advances in science, just in the past five to 10 years, the evidence for what the Bible claims to be true is just beginning to explode on the world scene. We're preparing to bring that information for future video content in the very near future. So if you're a believer and you don't know how to defend the Bible against the claims made by evolutionists, or if you're confused about the empirical history, um, the evidence of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, stay tuned. Click the like button and subscribe because the Lord has been providing so much information to us here on PUSH. Galatians 6, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God is not to be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. The one who sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What do I want to go over there? I think it was beautiful. And I love where your heart is, Rosie. You're muted, Rosie. <laughs> Rosemary, uh, I, I just invited Janelle. She might be asking to come join the room. 
She might be. Can you keep an eye out for her? Yes, of course. Thank you. So, yeah. There has been a buzzword lately um, within, like I was telling you, Stephen, a lot of the, um, who I consider to be biblically sound, um, people who are discipling the body, that buzzword of apostasy. And mm -hmm. my heart is where I think a lot of it, you know, some people might just decide that they just don't believe this, but there might be people out there that the scripture talks about my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that was nearly myself uh, for a long time. And what came across my radar, I don't know, maybe three, four weeks ago was um, a survey. And I'll just um, read it here really quick. This is just the, the little headline here. It says a recent survey from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University found that 9% of professing Christians possess a biblical world view. Um, this is a very low number by any standard. And of course, the only question that arises after reading the survey is why people who claim to be Christians do not have a biblical worldview. And um, I don't know if you have access to, yes, you can. Can you share that in the live stream at all from where you're at, Stephen? I can open it up. I cannot verify if um, they are seeing it on YouTube. Mr. Logan would have to tell us that, but I do have it open for at least us to read. Um, okay. What you can do, though, Rosie, is you can copy and paste it into the live stream chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that in a, a moment. That's a good idea. So, <clears throat> and several weeks ago, Stephen, you mentioned discipleship. And mm -hmm. I've been really meditating on what that means lately. And um, I've been discipled and that should be it. He who has much, much is expected. So um, there, one of the biggest things that I think um, for edifying the, the believers, the body of believers, is um, being able to discern truth from counterfeit. Um, and, you know, being able to actually test our own worldview doesn't match up with what the scriptures say. And if it doesn't match up with what the scriptures say, and there's things in the scriptures that are hard to understand or accept, we need to be in prayer with God, asking him to help us understand. Um, so... There's a few scriptures here that I'd like to start with because as far as discernment goes, it's very easy for us to want to hold on to what we feel. But if what we feel doesn't match up with what the scriptures say, then we need to abandon what it is that we feel. Um. There are several links in here also with uh, podcasts uh, that address a lot of different areas in this box as well. But Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can understand it. For from within, out of a man's heart proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, She yes. left the meeting. She, I was going to try and mute her. Uh, let's see. 
for da, 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 da. by the Portland's way missing one. mod is out there in the stream watching us so missing mod hi hi missy mod uh let's see romans 121 because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god neither were they thankful but became vain in their imagination and in their foolish hearts uh their foolish hearts was darkened proverbs 17 24 a discerning person keeps wisdom in view but a uh but the fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth and the last one proverbs 17 a the wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way but the foolishness of fools is deceit so in other words we need to be very careful um <laughs> You know, the, the, the scriptures have a lot to say, um, and there's about wisdom. He also um, says, seek wisdom from above, for he gives without prejudice. He'll give to anyone. Um, now, I'd like to open the floor if anybody has any ideas. Um, what does it mean? And I do have I do have a few articles here. One of them was Billy Graham, actually. I don't know if this disconnects me. Um, how do you suppose we go about um, discerning and then helping others to discern truth from counterfeits? So that is a really good question. And I think that you have to have a starting point, right? A foundation like anything else. And I think the foundation would be we have to know the scriptures. And we have to know them in context so that we're not doing what I call the song bite scripture, where we're taking a piece here and a piece here from different books, different chapters, and pasting them together. Because when you do that, you can literally create or validate any crap theology. So I would say knowing context is the very most uh, important thing. And that should be the foundation. Context, context, context. And if you notice, a lot of these prosperity gospel preachers out there, they will do an entire sermon off one verse and what I find ironic about it is a lot of times the one verse that they use is often from a passage that's condemning, like, say, Israel. Um, you know, like there's the famous one that they like to use. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper. That's a condemning passage. This is what I had planned for you and you guys blew it. Um, so just knowing, knowing the context behind Scripture is the starting place for creating you know, a sound doctrine. Very good. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Another thing that came to mind, I'm going to pull it up real quick, is um, uh, we've been given the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. But it's something that we have to grow into um, because it's, again, very easy for us um, because our heart is so wicked and deceitful to make our own Jesus. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, great point. Let's see. We well, well, and that's where we get the fluffy, cuddly Jesus who just loves everybody and you're sinning, no big deal. Like Jesus loves you just the way you are, right where you are. And that's true. Jesus loves you right where you're at, but he loves us too much to leave us there, right? And that's the point that 99.9% .9 of pastors leave out. You know, the love of Christ is a refining love. It's not a accept all your flaws love. The point of Christ is to refine those flaws out of us. And we miss yeah. that point. Mm -hmm. Now we can. Like where he talks about fiery trials. And the purpose for trials is to 
burn our our flesh off and to make us more like Christ. Um, we can. I have watched and witnessed, and it, it's very heartbreaking to watch people go through trials and not see the deeper meaning in it. So we can't avoid the fiery trials, as I've heard another um, minister say, but we can refuse to be refined by them. And so, mm. um, yes. And it's maddening to watch this witness that happen. It's maddening. Once you have found the keys that unlock the chains of your bondage, and then you want to give that to somebody else, it, it's that old reminder of that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. So, mm, yes, the heart is very, very rebellious. Even as children of God, even if we first come in, there's that, what does the name Israel mean for crying out loud? Go on. You know what it means. I was waiting yeah, for you to. Yeah, but you're on a roll. <laughs> oh, uh, the, what Israel means is it means to struggle with God. So there's a profound wisdom, in my opinion, about that entire idea is, you know, in every situation, rather than looking at other people as being the ones who have caused this or that to you, in your relationship with God, in my experience, what I've done, and I, I see it reflected in the prophets, um, and Jesus already knew, so he was definitely stood out from all of them, but the it's between you and God. Why are these things happening? What are you trying to teach me, Lord? What are you trying to let me go? Uh, what are you trying to burn out of me? Because what is the scripture, um, Stephen, where I, I can't do, I, I can't see he who does not pick up their cross and follow me. That one does not deserve me. Basically, yeah. Uh, he says, you know, that we're supposed to pick up our cross and follow him. What does that mean? And it means to crucify your flesh and follow him. Learn to love God as Jesus loved God and love others. But loving others goes in tandem like a coin. You cannot have love without truth. Not to do it God's way. Read the Gospels. I mean, they're beautiful and divine, but also incredibly convicting. <laughs> you know, sweet little Jesus said, what? <laughs> that would be a, right. a, you know, like they just, that's an idol. When you make Jesus into somebody, he is not, you know, and to follow him his example for how to love God, read the Gospels, watch what he's doing, how his relationship is with the Father, how his relationship is with other people. That is the, that's, you're eating his flesh. You're learning, okay, this is you. It's like, um, like an image, um, Like a spiritual imprint, the more that you continue to follow him and read the scriptures and study and allow it to saturate every cell in your body, your mind, your heart, your, your, your innermost being, allow it. Because some of those things are really hard. Well, and, and to it, touch on that, a, a good point to add, Rosie, is what are the two great commandments, right? Love the Lord God and love your neighbor. And in right. order to do that, you have to lay down yourself 
and love your neighbor first. You have to lay down yourself and love God first, which also goes along with our theologies. You know, that's one reason I really, I don't want to say I despise, but I really dislike associating with any particular denomination. And I get the value in it, right? Because when I identify as a Baptocostal, you can kind of understand my theology. You know that I'm not a Mormon, right? You know that I don't believe I'm a little God. So in that aspect, it's a good thing. But one way, one area where we cross the line is when we refuse to part with any theology in that denomination. That's a, a dangerous place where we make our denomination into our idol, especially if our denomination is teaching a doctrine that's not biblically sound and was formulated out of those sound by its scripture verses, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And, you know, <clears throat> and it's absolutely kind of the same. Re I mean, I go to a Baptist church, but um, if they were to teach me something, I, I, I haven't seen any issues with it, at, you know, and I think they're great. Um, but if there was an issue where there was a doctrinal issue and something about it contradicted what the scriptures say. Yeah. I'm going with what the scriptures say. Yes. Period. Yeah. And I'll call it out in a loving and gentle manner. Um, and, and that's, you know, the, that's the discernment that, that I'm talking about that I really, I'm. Like we're a voice crying in the darkness right now. If there are people out there <laughs> um, reading your Bible and understanding what the scriptures mean, um, it is a, it's a daily walk. Um, the Israelites in the wilderness are an example for us. Yes. They were given manna in the morning and they were given the... Somebody correct me. It's, it's a bird flesh. I, I can't remember. Um, and Jesus teaches us uh, the Lord's prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Um, most people know that one. <laughs> and he lived by example to show us <laughs> what an actual relationship with the father creator of the universe is supposed to look like. Um, and it is by, it, it's by grace that we're saved, not by our works, uh, which is that necessary atonement. So, you know, knowing that we're forgiven and that we're loved and purchased should give people a desire, a gratitude toward God that, um, would want to make them learn more about this, about who he is. You know, he, he took what, how many thousands of years? 60, is it 66 books? 66 yep. books. Um, 40, 44 plus human beings to actually write down. Um, reveal himself to us you think that we could give him some of our daily time <laughs> at least in the and I, I i'm always at but you know at least trying to make that effort to get into the word what how am i supposed to be living and yeah. what does it mean to love your neighbor well you know, and, and, and just to add not just giving god time out of your day right? But we're supposed to give him our first fruit of everything, which I believe even goes into spending time with him, right? As soon as we wake up, before our feet hit the ground, we should be praying and thanking him for the day and waking us up again, because that means he's not finished with us yet. And when we do our scriptures, even if we have to get up an hour or two before we have to get ready for work, we should be laying down ourself to put him first, to give him our first fruit offerings. Yeah, well, and and that is a that's a, a good suggestion. Uh, another one, um, what I do, um, 
I don't pause. I'm constantly in communion. Mm -hmm. From the day, from the moment that I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, I'm constantly in communion. I'm constantly seeking, um, you know, where the spirit is moving here and there. And some of the, the great tools that we have nowadays, see my cute little Grogu, <laughs> <laughs> um, is Bible app. E and you have earbuds or you can just, if you have um, a Bluetooth you can use the Bible app and listen, listen to the scriptures. That is the bread of life. It was the word made flesh. And he dwelt among us like it was all about him in the Old Testament pointing to him. Um, well, yeah. And, you know, when we do picture. spend that that continuous fellowship with him throughout the day, like you just described. I can noticeably tell a difference in my mood. You know, in between calls at work, I have the ability to watch YouTube videos. And if I'm watching stuff like, uh, you know, sometimes I'll watch videos with people getting pulled over and getting busted with large amounts of drugs. And, and But I find myself, if I do that, and I'm, I'm watching worldly things, not even necessarily wicked things, but just worldly things, you know, my attitude at work can sometimes be, you know, in want, but on the days when I'm watching scripture and I'm watching like Dr. Adrian Rogers sermons in between phone calls, I am so much more understanding, so much more compassionate to people I talk to on the phone. Like it's, it's really the difference between night and day. And that's another little example of picking up our cross and, and bearing it. Um, it's not just picking up the bad stuff and taking it as part of our faith, which that's a huge part of it. But picking up our cross should be getting closer to Jesus throughout the day, every day, picking up our cross and bearing it. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I didn't, what I'm talking about where I wake up and then I go to sleep and it's always just constant that I, I didn't like, I wasn't born that way. And so you know, what I have noticed is exactly what you're saying. I'm at peace and I feel like my cup is, is full and then I can pour into other people. Um, and once you start committing yourself, to him devoting your life devoting what you're doing to him it's like this is what i have been looking for my whole life you have found joy you know it where is it jesus says um he who he who drinks from the well what is that one the water, well, he who drinks the water that I provide will never thirst again. Right. He has a water that you drink, you'll never thirst again. Um, yeah. And, that, and it, that, that kind of goes into to the discipling because we have a limited amount of, of that something special from him in us unless we keep refilling it daily in fellowship with him and reading the word and worship. And it gets to a point where if we're not doing those things to keep ourselves full of that that spirit, then we're going to eventually pour out everything in our vessel into the vessels around us, doing the community work, doing God's work, and we're not going to have anything left here. So we have to keep filling that vessel with fellowship with him, with the worship with him, um, in order to make sure that we don't go dry trying to overfill it with other people. Yeah, you can you can serve yourself to death or, yes. you know, serve other people and then, yeah, do service to death <laughs> and and right, be burnt yeah. out on it. Yeah. And um, um, I just another note on on, you know, who he who drinks the water that I provide is it's not like you're what you're saying there. It's not like you're actually. Oh, I've had a drink of Jesus and then I'm fine for whatever. Um, the, the irony or the paradox is that 
you begin to have a, 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 a more of a hunger, more of a thirst. Like yes. once, once you've tasted it, you know, the truth it's, there's nothing else like his word on this planet. I, my mind is blown almost on a daily basis. And um, I would believe that that's part of worship is understanding what his word says, um, you know, and being sensitive to his spirit. Um, this is another part of that right here, because what I have noticed uh, and heard a lot is people will use their feelings. And they'll go with their feelings. But they won't check the scriptures to discern whether or not what they're feeling is truth or a gut instinct or you know just something that's fleshy or it could be a deceiving spirit is what your the impression that you're getting from it from the the realm around you you know our war is not with flesh and blood but with the principalities in the spiritual realm so and jesus warns of this um let no one deceive you um i don't have the scriptures pulled up but you know what i'm talking about there's warnings he warns us he warns us and the scriptures there's tons of scriptures in the epistles on how to test um, test for counterfeits because not every um, not every spirit is from God. There's there's yes. uh, talk of um, my son is over here trying to distract me. Like like all he wants is money so he can go buy something on his video game. It's incredibly distracting and we're live be gone or you get nothing well and yeah and to touch on what you're going on um that again goes back to the laying down self right because the the feelings on what scripture mean and what god wants for us comes from the heart but the heart is deceitful right that's what the scripture tells us that's why every quote-unquote feeling we have about the faith has to be tested against the unerrable word of god it has to be um if you have a a gut feeling or an instinct that goes counter to what scripture says a hundred times out of a hundred your gut feeling is wrong because the bible is a hundred times out of a hundred correct and being willing to lay down your feelings for what the word of god actually says is a big part of that it's laying down the self in order to grow closer to God in that relationship. It's putting God's words ahead of your feelings because right. he is the creator of the universe. He knows when we don't. <laughs> and that's why we have the word. He says, the word is a lamp onto my feet. And, and <clears throat> think of your body because you have been purchased. Your body is say, the lamp and the word of god is the oil and the more that you partake in the word and receive it with thanksgiving and it the more there is an illumination to perceive the world around you rightly does that make sense yeah sure it does yeah, you're like, your body is the lamp. And I don't know, I had that profound um, revelation about four or five months ago. And I was like, what? When he's talking about the, you have the 10 virgins. You know, there's foolish virgins and then there's um, the wise virgins. And, um, you know, they're all, they all have lamps. But only only the uh, wise ones have them filled well and so that goes is, back to what i was just saying about making sure your vessel doesn't run dry you know right. giving to everyone else without filling up yourself 
you know, the wise versions stayed in scriptures. They stayed in fellowship. They stayed in worship. Their their lamps were filled and ready. It was the virgins yeah. who got out of that pattern of fellowship, out of worship, out of reading God's holy scriptures that are the ones who are able to be deceived. You know, the longer yeah. you separate yourself from reading the word of God, the easier it is for you to start leaning on your own understanding, which we know is flawed. Yeah, very good point. Um, is it, uh, I pulled up one is Ephesians 5, 6. It's not very pleasant, actually. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Ephesians 5, 6. Uh, is, the title is uh, Imitators of God. Uh, for this, for of this, you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person that is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Mm. Ouch. Yeah. Death, Talk like, about you better you better straighten up. And, you know, and the reason that I'm emphasizing about the wise virgins and uh, the, the foolish virgins, I'm trying to encourage believers um, to get into the word and um, reach out to us if you have questions, because I have done a lot of research um, trying to understand the truth of God. I've like, even if it's there, my 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 posture towards it is i believe it's 100 percent true and if there's something that doesn't settle then i need to find that reconciliation because it's not me that's an error i mean vice versa it's not <laughs> right. the scriptures ah uh, it's it's the <laughs> the scriptures are perfect it's my heart or my mind that is twisted and needs to be sanctified out of whatever um misunderstanding you know because the scriptures were all bent every single one of us are bent in many ways yeah. um so i don't know now, also, I, I would like to really get Sarah in on this. Sarah, did you have any input for for where we're going? Not quite yet. <laughs> Not quite yet. Okay. okay. Fair. Uh, let's see. Um, hold on one second. You looking up another Spiritual. scripture verse? Yeah, spiritual wisdom. Let's see. Oh, uh, Rosie. Sir. Uh, did any of those people believe in reincarnation? In that, uh, what's it called? The, uh, study at that one place? Like, they ask them all the, uh, questions like if they believe in caramel stuff like that uh -uh. i can answer that for you though logan the answer is no there is no such thing as reincarnation i mean i heard before that her jewish sets that believes in reincarnation that's crazy i never knew that before do you I'll know tell anything? you what the scripture says yeah, i know there's no reincarnation but it's just weird. <clears throat> Hebrews 9.27. Uh, I do not like being searched. I much prefer Google. I don't know why it's it works this way. It's really strange. Um, just. Uh, redemption. But otherwise, Christ would not have had to suffer repeatedly once. Okay, that's a little more. Just as a man is appointed to die once and after that to face judgment. I mean, it's pretty clear. There is, there, yeah, you don't come back. You hey, don't get Rosie, do -overs. I have a question for you from the audience. This comes from Missing Mod. 
And Missing okay. Log would like to know if you have seen Mary Nell's YouTube channel, uh, which is called the RonWyatt.com. That's the one that Mary Nell runs. I'm not familiar with it, Mary Nell. Oh, wait, that's his ex uh, widow? Widowed wife, yes. No, I haven't. Her YouTube channel? It's the YouTube channel that she runs uh, in honor of Ron. Yep. No, I haven't. It's a really good channel, and it, it lays down all the evidence for Ron's claims. And I'm not sure whether we still agree or not on it, but the amount of evidence that is on that channel is just absolutely mind-blowing. And even like up to 10 or 15 years ago, it was still considered fringe, and his claims were really doubted. But in the last 10 or 5 years, or 5 or 10 years, a lot of it is starting to be validated to the point where even the Noah's Ark in Turkey has been recognized by the Turkish government because at this point it's just undeniable. The I real love Mount the Noah's Ark. Yes. And the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia now, which once was mocked because it was a Ron Wyatt discovery, it's now officially been verified as the actual Mount Sinai by even the Saudi Arabian government. Which wow. is just mind blowing, Stephen. Yeah, and if, mm. go ahead, Logan. Uh, uh, do you tell Ken Ham about this? He's a uh, big in Noah's Ark. Yeah, he has the Ark Encounter, and I really love his ministry. But I'm not on like talking oh. bases with him. Um, like I don't think I'm on his radar. I would love oh. to be, but I'm just not. Oh. What are those things you are holding? What part of the ark was that? Um, so the one that I was holding was the deck timber from Noah's Ark. And then also I got to hold the stone. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware we have found the actual location of where Christ was uh, crucified. And there was a stone that they used to cover the hole where the cross would sit in so that it didn't get filled up with rocks and debris. And they actually have the stone that covered the hole where Christ was crucified. And I got to hold that in my hand as well. And it was, it was amazing. I'm going to be working on a YouTube video about it this Sunday. Hopefully I can have it all edited by the end of Sunday because I would love to get it out there for everybody to see on Monday. But I really don't want to divert from the current conversation if we can help it, Logan, because oh, okay, um, I no, you're fine, buddy. I just I think it's really important. Um, and I Rosie had a great point. She wants to do less jumping around and try to stay on one topic at a time. And I agree that that's more fruitful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it, I'm already riddled with ADD. OK, but. Um, yeah so that would be discussed and and give it its full undivided attention at that point so where we're talking remember uh logan what the topic is for discussion right now about people have uh about people having bur uh, the biblical world field view being able to discern truth yeah. from counterfeit and yeah. how do we do that we adhere to what the bible says yeah you know, the, check. the scriptures scripture says that uh my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge yeah um well and not just the not just the discernment to filter out bad theology but also the willingness to lay down personal on biblical theologies. You know, for instance, just a quick example, I I identify mostly as a Baptocostal. I absolutely love the Pentecostal church. I love the gifts of the spirit. I love the worship that they have. But at the same time, there's theologies in the Pentecostal church that I just openly reject. Um, so I can't really consider myself like a full-on Pentecostal. And in, in the one that I would pick at the most would be speaking in tongues you know there's no question that speaking in tongues is biblical but the biblical definition of speaking in tongues 
is completely different from this tongue right. that they speak in the Pentecostal church. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is, is, uh, it is giving you another language to speak to somebody else who speaks a different language An actual like, language. Yes. That exists. Yes. I, it would I be like yeah. nothing about the tongues of men and angels. Go on, Sarah, share your opinion. I don't like have an opinion, but um, I remember scripture saying, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not. And I do not love. So maybe there is also angelic like um, language that that angels speak amongst each other and that you can that these that you can speak, you know, that's not a necessarily human language but it edifies you but it doesn't edify anyone else unless there's a translation of that angelic you know an, uh spiritual different kind of tongue other than and i know that the scriptures talk about there needing to be a translation of what they're saying for the listeners who are there that um, implies that it's somebody it else who speaks sense. that language it wouldn't make sense would it make sense to be speaking in another language in a room full of people who don't speak that language? So exactly, you would in, yeah. in order to have an interpretation that language given w would make more sense to me if it was some type of angelic language and not necessarily uh, just a. Well, talks about that I would as being something it, you do in private. Well, I mean, those are in, uh, you would just say it. In, you would just say it in the language of the people that are in the room. So that's why, like speaking in tongues, they say if you're doing it alone, then it edifies you. Well, we're talking about two separate things, though. Yes, like, it is. There's one different. where each man heard it in his own language. That's the right. biblical right. tongues like Paul addresses. Yes. The other one, correct me if I'm wrong, ladies, but I believe that it refers to it as a prayer language, which right. is when yes. it directs you to do it in your closet. It's not something yes, you're supposed exactly. to do in public. It's something that's supposed to be personal between you and God, which is the way my grandmother, who was Pentecostal, yes. used her tongue. She did it in private. She did it in prayer or just in the privacy of her home. You know, my issue with the way the Pentecostals use it, and again, I'm not bashing them. I love the Pentecostal church. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. But, you know, they'll often have somebody stand up and speak in tongues, and then you'll have two or three people stand up and give an interpretation. And often the interpretations completely counter one another. And it's like, okay, well, here's they're the interpretation. <laughs> right. They're doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. Either God's there's really two happy totally or really different angry. Things I can't going tell. On. Yeah. It's two totally different things going on there. Um, right. Well, see. and that, I'm that, trying that to again find is it. the point I was making earlier about knowing the context. The context really yes. does matter. And yes. for us to speak in our heavenly language in church, it doesn't edify anybody. It bears no fruit. You know, right. whereas it edifies, the it edifies you, but if you're doing it as it is really loudly and being disorderly, the, then it's pointless because it's just being disruptive of the service if you're screaming out in a language that no one understands and there's no translation. Right. That would be making it chaotic. And we know that we don't serve a God of chaos. You know, we serve a God of order, which is how he he requires us to conduct the church in an orderly fashion and each in his own turn. Oh, I was pulling it up. Um, and the tongues that he's speaking of or that she's described, Sarah, you're describing is um, it, the instruction, which I take all of the epistles as command. I don't look at it as these are suggestions. I look at it as if I do this, then unless God has something necessary that I need to go through to, to suffer for whatever reason, this is going to protect me if I am following what the scriptures are saying in context and understanding what those what that context is well and so, there's a purpose for each tongue right like the biblical tongues that paul's right. addressing that is for witnessing to people in other languages that you don't speak swahili but people who speak swahili can understand you 
the other one, the heavenly language, is, you know, for one situation, it could be used like, I have a lot on my heart, and I just don't even know where to start in my prayers, and I right. can pray in that heavenly language and communicate with God spirit to spirit. Hmm. Right. I'm looking for the part here. Well, as... um, I guess I don't have any problems with it at all, even in public, unless it is disruptive. No, if they do it, I'm just like, okay. It was, it's kind of neat that they do that because I, it's not a gift that I have. Um, I have more of a, mine is more of faith. Um, sometimes a revision, I don't have, I'd like to have tongues, but it would be like you said, it's, it's to benefit or edify the individual and it's supposed to be done in private. And it talks about also how tongues, what does he say? Tongues, uh, as for prophecy, they'll pass away. As for tongues, it'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Da, 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 da. Well, also another point that we oh, need there's... to keep in mind when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit like that is that not every believer, I don't think so anyways, you guys tell me your opinion, not every believer is equipped with every one of those gifts of the Spirit. Um, I don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, but I do have the gift of discerning spirits. I can discern if somebody has yeah, a wicked I can spirit too. about them. Um, yes. But I can't speak in tongues. And honestly, it doesn't make me sad that I can't speak in tongues. I, I communicate with God just fine in English. And the scriptures, Paul actually even says, you know, it's great. I even speak in tongues at home, but I would wish that you would prophesy more than that. Right. So um, that suggests to me to seek understanding in order to prophesy. Um, and what you're saying, yeah, discerning spirits is a is um, absolutely. I think it's a more <laughs> beneficial gift. <laughs> yes, it. Yes, it's wisdom, because if you can discern spirits, then you're number one, you're better off in knowing how to interact with people that might be afflicted or people, you know, are part of the body. Um, and it. If you take the word. Of God as being just completely honest and true things, the light just comes on. And, you know, can you guys relate with that? I mean, it's just the light comes on. You see much better. How can you love this person? How can you love this person? Mm. Talking about the lamp, he talks about the lamp. The, the eye uh, is lamp. If the eye is healthy, the whole body will be healthy. But if the eye is um, sick or dark, the whole um, the whole body will be dark. And if the light within you is darkness, how dark is that light? Sarah, I keep seeing your microphone glow. Are you wanting to share? No, I'm not sure why the microphone is glowing. I just um. I just have that Bible verse up. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, then I'm um, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal because then you're just showing off. Right. Just doing well, it flesh. You're just, you're not, you're not there caught up in the spirit in the middle of a worship service and just speaking in tongues into your the heavenly language. And, you know, and it's a, even sometimes when I hear someone else and they're doing their thing and it's, it, it is just in a way that you can tell that they are just in love, you know, with their savior and just speaking. And they are just, they are personally being edified during the service. Same as if they were speaking regular human words, or if they were um, singing the song that's actually playing or singing a different song in their head then I, I am so happy with it. It actually makes me feel very um, I'm happy for them. Happy for them. So as long as it's not disruptive, 
I guess I really, I just like it. I think it's wonderful. Right, but I'm looking for the scripture where Paul suggests that this is not a wise thing to do. And I can appreciate what you're saying um, because he was, I know what subjectively, yeah, subjectively, I don't personally have an issue with it, but it can be a stumbling block. And we don't want to cause people to stumble. So if we're not adhering to the suggestions that Paul is making about the appropriate time to do this or that. Well, I don't think he said it. He was just saying that you shouldn't be standing up and speaking loudly in tongues as if you, it's just disruptive if there's no translation. Because people are like, everyone is looking at that person and that person has shouted out. This huge thing, is. all the attention is on that person, and there's no translation. Of course, that's going to be a stumbling block because people are going to think, well, what kind of disorder is this? That would be a stumbling block. Obviously. Well, not not no, just that, yeah. Sarah, but I don't think any of you can show me a scripture where it mentions the ability to translate the language of angels, the prayer language. Speaking in every tongue. context where it talks about translating the tongues, it's referring to the one where you're speaking the tongues of man. Right. So the one of angels maybe doesn't really need to be translated. I don't know. No, exactly. That's exactly That's the thing. The thing, tongues. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah, okay. no, the, the one for tongues of angels is not. It's not for anybody except for the one who is having that experience. Right. Um, well, I also want to I want to lay out that I, I recognize the difference, right? Sometimes if people have the gift of speaking in tongues and they're just in a worship service overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit and it just starts coming out and they can't stop it. OK, I'm not going to limit the Holy Spirit. Right. But for the ones who do it every worship service routinely and if you guys go to a, a particular church for an extended period of times you know the ones who do it every week i just don't see the fruit in it and you know to make a point off of what you mentioned rosie i do see it as a stumbling block for anyone new coming to the church that's what i was going to read right here i found well, it go ahead okay uh first corinthians 14 um i'll start at 18 this is paul i believe corinthians yeah he says i thank god that i speak in tongues more than all of you mm -hmm. but in church i would rather speak five coherent words to instruct others than ten thousand words in a tongue brothers stop thinking like children in regard to evil be infants but in yeah. your thinking, be mm. mature. It is written in the law. By strange tongues and foreign lips, I will speak to this people. Mm -hmm. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign not to believers but to unbelievers. Right. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not unbelievers. So <laughs> if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who are uninstructed or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you have lost your minds but if an unbeliever or uninstructed person comes in while everyone is prophesying he will be convicted and called to account by all and the secrets of his heart will be made known so he will fall face down and worship god proclaiming God is truly among you. Yeah, he's obviously saying that the prophecy is of more value for the um, greater good of 
bringing people to faith. But if you have a, a big church and all they're doing is, oh, I'm gonna, people are like, this is weird. I really don't see why well, I've not been in many services. The just said I've that. Regular, regularly. I, I, okay, I that hear it sometimes, but I've never been really yeah, in service okay. where that's being, where it's that disorder. Pentecostals. Ask Steve, isn't that a Pentecostal thing, Steve? I mean, I, growing up in the Assemblies of God, there are times where three quarters of the congregation is praying in tongues at the same time, which I always found odd, right? That three quarters of a 300 member congregation all got the same gift. None of them got discerning of spirits because I've seen how they live outside of church. Oh my <laughs> and gosh. None of them got the gift of prophecy, but they all speak in a heavenly language. That shows exactly what, what he just said here, Stephen. Yep. Well, not just that, Rosie, but it makes other believers tongues. like me, it makes other believers like me feel like, well, am I really it's saved? Uncomfortable. Do I have the Holy Spirit? Because I'm yeah. the only one in this church not speaking in tongues. Right. And what you're seeing is they're actually not doing what the scriptures say to do. They're not falling in line. Now, <laughs> I will say for Sarah's defense, Paul does state there that he would rather and that it's more beneficial to prophesy than speaking in tongues. So he's not saying that you can't do it, but I do believe he's or warning that against no it. Or that there's no benefit. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying there's anything against it, but what he's yeah. saying here is um, do it at home. Or if there is something that's given it, there's going to be somebody there that's going to understand it. If it is for another language, somebody is, is he talking about an interpreter there. For if if you're talking to somebody in a, in a specific a, a tongue and it's the Holy Spirit that's lit your your tongue on fire, there's going to be an interpreter there that's going to uh, profit from it. Um, if you're just doing the tongues of angels in an assembly, um, and at, that's encouraged beyond like edifying and um, prophesying. People who come in that might be looking for truth are going to be turned off. I mean, that's clear to me. I understand that, that that's what the scripture is basically saying. How well, do you, and it, go ahead, Sarah. Um, how do you rectify as, um, you know, Paul, the very opinionated and not... Not everything that he says is he's saying, you know, the Lord has told me this, the Lord has told me that. There's a lot of his personal convictions, such as let your women keep silent, don't speak, be in submission. You want to learn something? Ask your own husbands. It's shame no. for a woman to speak in church. So, like, he has his, not everything that is here is like, oh, my goodness. You know what I mean? If we don't believe mm -mm. and think just like him, just like him, that. You know, oh my goodness. Well, okay. If he thinks that five words, he'd rather not, he would rather speak those five coherent words and speak in tongues, then we should definitely not be speaking in tongues, but instead only go no. for the prophecy kind of a thing. Uh, like that's going to be the sure. greater thing. Let her finish though, Rosie. Let, she's getting out of thought. Okay. Well, just understand that even he is saying, you know, that he who speaks the tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the whole church. So he's not saying that they can't do it in church. Right. They're just saying it's not going to edify the whole church. However, people, you know, I mean, it, it depends. You know, a lot of people have different opinions on this. And some people have a real big problem with Paul, you know, because in one mode, people are like, okay, so if you're going to take him so seriously on that, but he says other stuff. And you're not taking that seriously, you know, like as if Jesus is speaking, it comes straight to your brain or into your heart and mind. I, I'm just careful with stuff. That's all. That's all I'm saying. I'm just careful. I try not to be too opinionated or hold too much well, um, and I, to anything I except the Holy Spirit to teach me and guide me. And, well, and no one, Yeah, and I appreciate what you're saying. And none of us are going to do it perfectly for crying out loud. But the but the thing is, if you read the scriptures and you understand the hermeneutics and the context is like what Steve was talking about there uh, earlier, that callback is. Um, uh, 
I lost my point. <laughs> That's okay. Well, and I will um, say this. I right. and Rosie can probably <laughs> well, Rosie can definitely confirm this. I have a special relationship, especially with Paul, because coming out of the Hebrew <laughs> roots, before I came out of the Hebrew roots, I went through the, you know, testing all things. And when I first started testing Paul, I was a very, very firm believer that he was a false apostle. And after God brought me out of the Hebrew roots and I continued to test Paul, I came to realize that he is absolutely a a Holy Spirit filled apostle. And he's actually my second favorite apostle now out of all of them. Right. Right. Uh, next to Peter. Yeah, I love Paul. Paul is it, it, aside, uh, apart from Jesus. He is my favorite. Now, to um, address what you're talking about with uh, not speaking in church, uh, hermeneutics plays a really great tool in understanding exactly what he's talking about. Because back in that culture, you had women on one side and men on the other. And he's talking about don't disrupt the sermon for the sake of a question. Ask your husband at home. Don't yell across to your husband. That's what that's about. And when Paul has an opinion, rather than it being God, he clearly states that this is of me, not him. This is not uh, of God, but rather me. Like where he says, if you're if you're um, single, don't seek a mate. But if you're, ten, you know, so those kinds of in context, you understand that that's uh, he makes it very clear where it's him and where it is prophetic well and that's um, a, that's a perfect example you just gave rosie of he's not like with the if you're single stay single and there is totally a benefit to that because like as a single person you have the ability to be in ministry unregulated all your extra time can go to god so there is a benefit there but mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get married. You know, he's just giving right. a stage wisdom of what would be wiser, what would be more beneficial if you can obtain that. And I think yeah. that same principle applies to the tongues. You know, he's not saying that you can't speak in tongues in church. But one, we definitely need to have context of which tongues he's referring to. And two, what kind of fruit does it bear? If someone from a, a Mormon church comes to a Pentecostal church because they're seeking truth and they walk in and eight people are speaking in tongues at once and then six people are standing up to give an interpretation, they're going to think God is bipolar. I <laughs> would. I remember right. coming from the Baptist church. Like, you know, I went funny. to the Baptist church for like the first five years of my life, uh, maybe even seven, eight years. Then I went to the Pentecostal church. And the first service I ever went into, I thought God was nuts. I did. Like it was not fruitful. I and guess I haven't had time. those experiences. So that's probably why, because I haven't had those experiences to develop that kind of uh, feeling about it, I guess. Yeah, well, that's the point. The difference is like he's saying you're already a believer, but the, the sign for tongues, like that you're the referring to the tongues of angels, is a sign to unbelievers. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have to consider that this world is dying. That should be our number one priority, is seeking the lost. And if the scriptures are saying, you know, these this kind of behavior and I'm not the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't like what I have to say, I'm, you know, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I just read and I see what the scriptures say to do. And I understand. And it's clear if you read it, why? I'm a big why person. I have asked that question for, you know, since I was little because I didn't know the scriptures until I was 30. I was 30 years old before I came into these, until into the the holy grail of, of manna from heaven. You know, God was always with me, but I just didn't 
I didn't have all this. That's why it's so profound and important to me that um, people know the value and the importance in, in, uh, of, like you, Sarah, you're seasoned. You know, you walk with God daily. But we have, did, did you, were you here um, from the beginning? When I yeah. read this part, that was, that's a big alarm to me um, that cries out. Oh, that's what I was going to say. It, it cries out a uh, concern to know that only 9% of professing Christians have biblical worldviews. And I've heard the buzz in the secular world, in the Orthodox Jew, um, um Shapiro, uh, Ben Shapiro, um, William Lane Craig, Elisa Ch Ch Childers, Ch Childers. Just a brief uh, public service announcement. If everybody in the chat could please be respectful to one another, um, you know, conduct yourself like Christ is watching you because Christ is watching you. Um, I love everybody out there, but just you know, love your neighbor and not just your neighbor, but love your enemy. So just try to be respectful, guys. Sorry, go ahead, Rosie. I made you lose your train of thought, didn't I? Yeah, I lost it. What was I saying? See, what I just did was not fruitful. <laughs> We're all learning. My heart. To this is oh oh all these okay Elisa Childers um there's several others uh Jen Markell like none of these people in their ministries connect to one another but everybody is seeing an apostasy um also AKA deconstruction they're deconstructing their faith no. Absolutely not. Mr. Skybro, you're going to have to have a personal conversation with Rosie in chat first so you guys can hash that out if possible. Um, but mm. she is the host of this show, so I have to honor her wishes. Mm -mm. He... Um, an apostasy. The buzz just in the past month, everybody's noticing what's going on right and then you start putting it together my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge that fuels something inside of me to cry out to try to help others find the resources that they need while there's still time because i don't you know where we talk about prophecy steven do you know the uh, the the prophecy about um what is it that is promised first and then the man of perdition the apostasy must happen first yes the apostate church which we're seeing right now especially in oh. the methodist church and and more than the methodist church the church of england has just come out that they're going to be blessing same-sex unions. Um, so the apostate church is here now, and it's setting up for for the man of sin. Well, and not even just like them just kind of like taking Christianity and taking it and making it into something else. I mean, mainstream traditional branches of faith are emptying out. Um, if you go on uh, Ben Shapiro's channel, Daily Wire, I think it's one of the very first ones he's had for the top. It's a recent interview with William Lane Craig, and they're having this discussion about it. And um, I found William Lane Craig's um, insight fascinating. And um, it, it, it's a call that as long as there is still time we should be crying into the dark to the dying world well another um, reason why 
they're flooding out of the church is because we've watered down the gospel. We've watered down God's commandments. And the spirit within us can discern truth. And we know when we're not being fed. And we really do a disservice to Christianity when we do that. That's why our churches are starting to empty out in so many different denominations. Because people are saying, well, if truth is relative and church history can override the word of God, then then nothing about the faith is a solid. Nothing about the faith is dependable, which means God can't even be dependable. So we're hurting the faith when we do that. We really are. And we're causing yeah. the, the emptying of our church ourselves. Yeah. Um, Alpha and Omega Ministries, um, I'd have to share a link maybe later on when this is uploaded. I could I could do some editing. But there was a video that he had that was talking um, about what the original church fathers actually had said about sola scriptura, um, that it was enough. Because once you start adding um, writings that are not inspired, not not inerrant, then what you're saying is that God's word is not enough. Well, and and, take the Torah, especially like that's a perfect uh, that's a perfect segue into Torah. You know, God tells us not to add to or take away from. We're not supposed to build these artificial fences around it, um, which is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. And they're doing that now in the church. Um, they're adding theology that's not there. Um, and even, you know, I want to be careful, but even some of the earlier church fathers, they've got some great opinions, but their opinions, in my humble opinion, it is not the word of God. Um I, I've used this example before. If it's something outside of the canon that we have today and it complements scripture, then yes, use it as a second witness by all means. Right. But if it's something that's not verified in scripture or counter to scripture, I take it as total crap. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have to remember, especially um, with writings that are um, extra biblical, um, take into consideration that. These people are, they're flawed like the rest of us. And um, if they have something that it could potentially, yes, actually have an, an you know, um, a revelation according to what the scriptures say. But that doesn't mean that they themselves are inerrant. So you don't throw the babies out with the bathwater. But right. you do test what they are claiming against the holy inerrant and authoritative word of god that's discernment and Sarah, understanding you, you would have a unique perspective on this uh being messianic um i know that like myself you have studied out many of the extra biblical books what is your opinion on if there are passages in the extra biblical books that seem to counter scripture or torah um or even if it's just going over something that's not explicitly addressed in our canon? Um, I would say that um, just as when people read the scriptures themselves and they say, this is contradicting this, this is contradicting this, this is contradicting this, and it causes, well, it, this is in parentheses, causes them not to believe. Of course, it doesn't cause them to believe because they just don't want to believe in the first place. Mm. Um, but that the extra biblical um, books, I find them valuable. But then it, it depends on where you are, where you are in your in your spiritual growth, whether they're going to be beneficial to you or just interesting books to read. And oh, this this is good advice, and this was good advice. But you know, the rest of it, that was just interesting to read. So it depends on the heart of the person reading it. But what, what I did have thoughts of something that I wanted to share with Rosemary. And I Go don't ahead. think that she was meaning uh, um, stumbling block. She was explaining that. I, I think she might have used a word that she didn't mean to um, concerning hmm. the tongues. It's possible. 
it's possible because I was, uh, no, yeah, I was just thinking, I was like, I don't think that that stumbling block is, to use, I don't think she means to use that in that context because the stumbling blocks in scripture are usually um, not to put a stumbling block in your brother's way would be, um, I like to keep them from, from, from falling into sin and, or um not to put a stumbling block by eating things sacrificed to idols or something. Um, don't put a stumbling block. I'm just doing some scanning here. Um, yeah, there, for things, lack that's of better like, word, I, I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah because that but, would be more just like they might just think you're crazy, you know, but then they'll just go to a different church that doesn't do that and hear the truth. You know hopefully, what I mean? Like, you would hope. hope. You'll see, before you turn right. aside, I said, oh, there was a... Um, I, I understand what you're really saying. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a liber. Don't become a stumbling block in your in your liberty, right? Um, yeah, that's within the body of Christ. I, yeah, you're right that I was using the wrong term because I, for lack of a better word, is you know. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. You, I was, I, I was like, okay. Yeah, so you're right. Really, I don't think she meant to. To. Say I don't that. mean it like. Yeah, I don't mean it in the same sense as it is meant. Uh, like uh, you're because it it, it's a very serious brethren. thing it is a very serious yeah to make us yeah a stone block. let her fin However, let her finish her thought say, Rosie. didn't it say in scripture also that um christ was a stumbling block a rock to make men stumble a st to make a rock yeah um but that's in direct I'm reference to the to the pharisees um he was yes. uh, uh, a stone a stumbling of stumbling block. yes Right, the, the message of Christ crucified. Okay, it says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block. And it says, uh, the message of Christ crucified is a stumbling block because it strikes at the root of man's self-righteousness and rebellion. So it's a different type of stumbling block. But um, either 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 one of those is still is not, is a little bit different from... Um, from somebody walking into a, a church and being like, well, I've never experienced anything like this before. This is weird, you know? Yeah, and they move on. Yeah. See, well, okay, and again, and, like, and here it, moderation too, you know? Like, if God puts it on your heart to speak in tongues, okay, you're you're working within the spirit, but don't do it out of routine because that's right. what people are expected to do at that particular church service. Right. Same goes for prophesying. If God puts a prophecy on your heart, then by all means, you would be sinning to not share that prophecy. But don't just feel like you have to share a prophecy in every service with somebody next to you, because then we're acting in our own feeling. Go ahead, Rosie. Very good. No, no. What you're saying there is something that I have had to learn self-control with, because unintentionally just because I have such a zeal for the word because I had been deprived of it for most of my life that I tend to be overwhelming to people with prophecy with you know having a, an understanding of the full picture of the dim glass right the right. end time stuff a lot of people what they talk about women um, the men, uh, you know, warming their way into a women's homes uh, were weighed down with sin and um, that these they talk about these women being weak willed women who are always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. OK, and. I am just so I have a lot of. Uh, I'm very zealous for it, and I'm just, I don't know, how there, and I hit Kenya, oh my gosh, you know, and I do, I don't, I, so I've had to learn to ask God to help me pull back and wait for his timing, because oftentimes I can cause, not, not harm on a spiritual sense, but people don't, like, I don't want to be around you, you know, because I'm, I just, I'm so grateful for the truth and, you know, learning to love others is also respecting how much someone else can receive at any given time. Portions, small portions. 
rather than just trying to like dump the whole truckload on people. That's it. <laughs> Very well said. Sarah? I'm learning. Yeah. I'm still having thoughts about, like, I know that the women were separated, you know, back then. And I actually like the idea very much. That's something we like. Um, the women on one side, the men on the other side. I like that. Um, um, I still, you know, I mean, we always try to explain, okay, that's why he said women should remain silent, you know, not in church. They should, that they, yeah, they have to remain silent. They're not allowed to speak, period. It doesn't say they're no, not No, that's allowed. what people do to twist the scriptures. Because that's the it. key for hermeneutics. No yeah, because in church, if I was going to be in church. She, she was finishing she, a thought, Rosie. Okay, but. <laughs> it's okay. What I'm just saying is that. Um, I understand that there's like um, possibilities, you know, when you read scripture and there's a way to explain, okay, he really didn't mean this when he said this. And he meant that when he said that, okay, when he said that it would, he really meant it that way. And over in this one, he really didn't mean it that way. Now, during that time, I don't think women were really prone. So I wonder what was going on during that time to make w women. Women so weren't what? They weren't boisterous at that time. It's not like something that they would naturally do to be. Well, this is a mixed, this is a mixed church of both Jew and Gentile. Was well, it? Also, you guys need to keep in mind, you know, I always say revert back to context. So the men were the ones who would go to Torah class. They would be the ones who were going to Torah school. So they were versed in scriptures. They knew right. the appropriate questions to ask. Whereas women would get Torah lessons on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, but they didn't go to Torah school, so they didn't have as much information. Um, so I think that's why Paul didn't want them trying to share doctrine, because they just didn't have the biblical foundation, you know, rightfully so, uh, that the men had at that time, because they went to school and learned Torah daily. Whereas it's the women really, had to get it from their dads or their husbands. I know. Yeah, but I there were women in ministry it. also at that time. So it's it's about the context of that particular situation. Paul had women who were ministering and sharing the gospel with him. They're mentioned in the scriptures. Well, They're course. mentioned I mean, in the epistles. Even, so even it's not Deborah about the, the women prophet. just like, oh, oh let's just sorry. go. Right. That's what I'm saying is that in this situation, He's giving instruction for the, the greater good of everyone to be edified. So if he had to address it, there had been an issue. And, you know, hermeneutics is what teaches us about the culture at that time. It's not just speculating or, you know, pulling ideas out of our hats. Um, when you study the history behind it. Uh, if you're interested, Sarah, I have um, Mike Winger's video that talks about women in ministry, and he addresses that particular passage um, about it. And, you know, there is there's a beautiful evidence. Interesting here. It, on some site, ChristianityToday.com, it says the infamous instruction in 1 Corinthians 14 that women should remain silent in churches was added later and was not written by the original author, St. Paul, according to the analysis of ancient manuscripts by academics at the University of Cambridge. The presence of a tiny dash, known by scholars as a, whatever that word is, which indicates a section of text later added and not present in the earliest versions, could unravel centuries of that theological debate. That's interesting. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's, uh, like I said, Mike Winger has, like, it's, <laughs> excuse me, hours disgraceful, long, disgraceful. and that person that he's it's making huge. that claim, yeah, that, the person that's making that claim that you're talking about, there's, like, he's not the only one that has made claims, and, and, um, Mike Winger has refuted each of their arguments, because there are people on all sides trying to figure out 
what this means. And they're like, well, maybe it was this and maybe it was that. And he goes into the history of it. Um, well, they, it is not just them, of course. It's scholars. There's scholars that are working on it and stuff. Yeah, but what are, what are scholars? I mean, I will, say, I will say this, though, Rosie. We're really trying. I, I, like, I like Mike Winger, but I have seen several of his things that I totally disagreed with. Um, especially on some of his lessons he did against the Hebrew roots movement and their obedience to the Torah. Um, so I, I wouldn't take everything he says as the gospel, but he's a flawed person like the rest of us. Who's, who's right. really well. But he also but leaves it on the table. Yeah. Right. But he also leaves it on the table and he says this and this and this and this, and you can't just pull up one website. You have to do the research. That's and a true. lot of what he has done is address each of these scholars from these, the, the people that write the commentaries on these um, uh, particular passages to understand things. He has addressed each one of them. Uh, let's see. Um, the Women in Ministry is a series. Um, I guess... And <laughs> Just this one right here, Women in Ministry, part four. Oh, I could probably find the one, uh, Women Keep Silent in Church. Uh, and it, unless it's something like, let's see, hold on. Actually, it's probably a subtitle. It, if Even if you think about it, as I am. Uh, can't type and speak at the same time even if you think about it why would he say to keep silent and then also have women who are there to help minister no, to why, the fallen that's world that's why people just that's why people do their best to say oh well it must have been that this and this is yeah and mm. together and you try to explain it but they're saying like i mean you never know that's if it why turns you out that that it was his Paul's self, this is self-contradiction where he apparently tells people, women, to be silent in chapter 14. There has after, to be a reason. After well, Rosie, Rosie, we have to let her finish her thought. Otherwise, we don't know how to properly respond. Hmm. Okay, in chapter 14, after he had already instructed them to prophesy in the church in chapter 11, so they could like openly stand up, prophesy, in chapter 11 but in chapter 14 you know don't so that's where they okay maybe it's like you're saying they were actually asking a question about torah but then the way that he says that if he said it and maybe it was added a little bit later makes it like kind of like overly like it's disgraceful you do not you need to remain silent i mean so it's like kind of like they're trying to say like maybe this wasn't added later maybe it wasn't penned exactly by him but they're trying to explain that because the only other way to to say that it was that it is that he did say that and then you have to come up with all the, these different reasons with all within culture context this that that to explain it what it, to people who just read it and go what the what the what the crazy cray cray you know is he saying that that's so mean to say so blatantly remain silent you're disgraceful if you speak in church it's just that's disgraceful. Eisegesis, yeah that's but it, those are really strong that's not words very strong silent i tell my kids hush remain silent in the churches it's disgraceful for a woman to speak period in the church it doesn't say yelling across the aisle it doesn't say any of that stuff. It's very so overt. And so whenever you have something like that, you have people with a lot of questions. Well, so, and that's that's why I personally lean towards the idea that it's more because women were not trained daily in Torah the way men were. Yeah, we're there trying were to make some sense women right. There were some women who Paul ordained for ministry, but these are special cases from families where the women would have been trained in Torah or like you, Rosie, they were so zealous in their faith that they learned Torah quickly. 
but that's not the majority. And I feel like Paul here is addressing the majority, not the minority. Mm -hmm. It's just written in such a very, um, it's such a cut and dry way. It's not just, you know, yeah, I, 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 I wish he had been a little, a little more eloquent in explaining, like, listen, you guys just stop talking, shut up. You know, you might as well just say that. Girls, you ladies need to just shut up. Well, you know, out. you do have to also <laughs> remember not not just um, that, but, you know, we have to understand the context of what exactly it is he is addressing, but what we are reading is a translation. Yep. So that's, right. that's why I'm so careful mm -hmm. and I don't really necessarily go with anyone. One person says this, and one person says this, and one person says this. This one makes sense. That one could be true. That one could make sense. So in the end. So what just... do you decide? Okay, here's your discernment. What do you decide? Do you just like let it go and go, I don't know? Or do you actually try and figure out why this is the way it is? It depends if it's going to actually help me. If it's if it's going to help my faith or help me minister to someone else, then yes. If it's going to really edify, if it's going to if it's going to help me grow the fruits of his Holy Spirit so that I can be a better mother and better friend and edify the, the church and witness to the lost, then yes. If not, no. I don't know. Where do you find your thought? answers? There's but only so I much time in the day. Thought? There's only so much time in the day for me to put too much time and energy. It's interesting, but only so much time and energy is going to go into that. So I also just want to point out for you ladies that Paul is addressing a time in the church when the stories of the crucifixion, the story of grace, the redeeming power, the blood of Christ is still very new. Paul's talking about a lot of these things before any of the New Testament was penned. So mm -hmm. this is new information that people are learning, and it was very important at that time that it was precise and correct and weighed against the Torah. You know, because at the time that was our scripture to compare to mm -hmm. versus today, we've had 2000 years of the New Testament. So women have had the same opportunity to become learned in the scriptures the same way a man is now. But that wasn't That's the case 2000 yeah. years ago. Right. That's putting our situation the way our lifestyle and culture is now and cramming it into a culture where it was different. So you have three aspects of things going on. You have the hermeneutics of understanding the historical. Um, you have the trying to figure out whether um, uh, exactly what does the scripture mean because um, what we have is a translation. You and what? absolutely what you're talking about is the, the cultural differences. Uh, it's a, a core effect. I believe the word is cohort. When you know someone of, of generations past and lived in a certain culture, as opposed to today, where it's offensive to be a housewife and raise kids now. I know. Um, I was gonna say that say like to honor, to walk humbly with our God, to love justice, and to love mercy, to seek justice and to walk humbly with our heavenly father is the most prime importance so if a person gets into the scripture and they read that from paul and they decide i'm just not going to speak in church as a woman because i read that and they don't understand and maybe they don't have the capacity to understand the historical aspects and all that stuff not everybody is first of all capable second of all have necessarily time or resources or they're just more innocent minded so they say you know what i'm just not going to you know and they find the value in that and in and in that they have chosen to walk humbly and um to seek still mercy so that if somebody does speak out be like i don't understand why they're doing that but they don't become judgmental or rude to another woman who speaks out or tries to share um an opinion or raise her hand and stand up and ask a question in the middle of a church service um and is doing so humbly and um seeking you know for justice that that can still 
be very pleasing to our Father in Heaven, whether she understands everything properly or not, because we're to walk in spirit and by faith, not by necessarily sight, not necessarily by understanding every tiny little thing either. There, it's of course very valuable, but there certainly have been people throughout the ages who have led people to Yeshua with nothing except their testimony of what they saw, what he's done, just their personal testimonies of what he's done for them and led them to him. And then they start their own personal journey, you know, whether they get into the full. I hope they've got a Bible. Yeah, I hope so. But, you know, they didn't always have that for a long time. Sometimes you know, they, had and... one, they had one chapter and it was penned uh -huh. and copied and then the whole, you know, the whole community learned that one chapter and it was like years before somebody brought them another chapter and they mm -hmm. they grew in faith and they grew in love and they grew in understanding scroll, the holy spirit guided be, them i'm talking about like the missionaries whenever the the bible was being spread across the the world you know so i mean it's, it's all very you know important to know what you can know when you can know it but it's definitely not necessarily the most important thing to know everything about everything and why the I why. I disagree. Everything. Well, and I as just want to share these, these two things is one, these opinions on what Paul meant are just that, they're opinions. And any man who says that he knows 100% what Paul was saying is flat out a liar. Because we don't have all the context, not even the Jews in Israel have 100% of the context from 2,000 years ago. They have a great understanding, but they don't know the exact politics going on at the time. And I personally, I like to err on the side of caution, um, especially when speaking out in the church. And I don't just apply that to women. I apply that to myself. I have very rarely yeah. been in a church service where I speak out like that, um, if ever. Right. Because I am so terrified of speaking out of turn and not speaking out of being influenced by the Holy Spirit, but being influenced by my emotions. Um, and I have acted so many times, especially in my 20s, outside of the will of God, that the idea of doing it now that I'm a seasoned believer terrifies me. Um, so I would think that that's good advice to this day for both men and women. Yeah, it's hard I for agree. me too, because I feel more. Now that I th that I know more, I'm more cautious. Not I don't speak out more because the more you know, the less you, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> right. That's true. But we are to examine the scriptures like Bereans and always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have within us. Well, obvious. we are. That's, if people are asking questions, we need to have answers. The okay, scripture, but not everyone is. Not okay. everyone is capable. Everyone has a different intelligence. Everyone has a different calling. And like I was just saying, pe revival has spread and people's lives have changed and stuff. Not, not because, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I think that we're not speaking about the same thing. Obviously, what am I saying? If you're, obviously, if you have a specific ministry to people, and you 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 know that you're trying to reach a specific type of people that have all these questions and you have the intelligence and you have the holy spirit's calling to delve into this knowledge that's so so big yeah i don't want to be to accused do. of being lukewarm that's my point is that's i need well, to be, be on fire you could be on fire. People have been on fire and, 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 and spread the gospel with four chapters in their pocket. You know, so it's not necessarily, I mean, they've traveled the, this, this traveled the globe and was brought to all the countries of the world. And they were able to answer the people's, you know, core questions, you know, and just having four chapters of the Bible in their pocket. And bring thousands and millions and millions to Christ. And of course, from there, they have to grow and they have to read on their own and search the scriptures that they have, you know, which so, they have. And we should, of course. But the whole, the whole episode is about discernment. 
and um, being able to disciple. We can't just say, oh, no, no, that's not discipleship. We get what he's saying that. We, what I'm saying that. is we have resources so that people who have questions, we give them these resources in order for them to examine the evidence for themselves. We don't just like throw babies out the bathwater because, you know, well, we don't know, you, maybe we you... thought this or I'm saying I have done the research on this stuff. That particular um, series. I have watched it more than once. And he's fair. And I don't think you just like throw him out with the bathwater because you have a, 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 a you, I, every one of these people that I have research that I have resources. I don't agree with any of them. A hundred percent. That's the human condition right. because we have our own biases toward our own, what we think of something. But if we are to sharpen iron, sharpening iron, the better we can come together in our understanding and try to find, you know, where is the truth in this? Could I offer yeah. a third perspective? Yes, please. So, so my perspective on this is a little unique. Um, and I don't mean this in a holier than any other thou uh, way, but I try to really rely more on the Holy Spirit when it comes to sharing my knowledge. And what I mean by that is I have found that I am more effective when the Holy Spirit brings people with questions to me rather than me trying to of go course. out and witness to everybody. Um, because a lot of times when I do that, I'm giving the wrong advice at the wrong time. It may not be what somebody needs to hear at that time. So I'm just personally a little cautious with that i still witness you know through my walk yeah. but i really try my hardest and i fail sometimes um but i try my hardest to wait to share my knowledge until god sends somebody to me okay but and i hear what you're saying I, i'm not jumping out in my car and and putting on a sign that says jesus is coming that's not what i'm saying if i'm right. creating a platform <laughs> right here naturally People who are inquisitive are coming by, by the, <clears throat> by the way that the platform is des by design, like you were just saying, if he puts people in my life, well, if they're putting people in my life to ask questions, this is a platform for people to come. Sure. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not jumping in my car. I'm running out and doing evangelism unless I do have evangelists um tools in my car that i keep in there in case there is an opportunity and i've started to incorporate other beneficial tools because situations are different depending on um the people that i might encounter so um you know i'm adding more to my toolbox for my vehicle but i'm not going out of my way i'm well, going also out to do my chores or you know to do the grocery shopping or do this or that and, you know, it's the whole idea of the Good Samaritan where you see someone in need and what is it that they need? So I well, need to have those resources on my mule, if you will. Well, what we're also talking about, though, is like a personal conviction. And I am a firm believer that the Holy Spirit doesn't equip every believer exactly the same. I agree. So for Sarah, it's totally reasonable and understandable that she would have more of the approach I take where God just has convicted us to more often than not wait for people to come to us. And Rosie, you could be just as right where the Holy Spirit has equipped you for more. Yeah, of I'm not saying everybody human. should be living you could, like me. you could both be right. No, I'm and that's what I'm saying. It Paul talks about different parts of the body da, yep. da, 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 and how we're all being uh first peter talks about we're all being built up like living stones right so we are all different you know i don't have the same testimony or a piss my my vessel is in the tablet where he has written his um you know his truth on my heart 
it is it's different than it is for you or or Sarah. Well, and right. I'm not I'm not um I'm not faulting you for it. But what I'm I'm just saying that there I have a I just feel like we're in we the last minute ready. of the we last day. We need to be ready to give e either way. She is saying How can we need to be ready to give an account to anyone who asks. That is what well, she's she said anyways. So yeah, we need to be ready. Well, and not just God equipping us separately for mm -hmm. our different types of witnessing, but God has also equipped, you know, the three of us, especially with totally different testimonies that can witness to different people. Sarah, I feel like you've yeah. been a seasoned believer, you know, the majority of your life. So you can witness to other believers like that on how to keep the faith consistently through your life. And Rosie, you have a testimony of coming to the faith very late in life. And you relate to people I can't relate to. And I have a testimony right. of being raised in the faith and then falling extremely far into Babylon throughout my 20s and then coming back as the prodigal son. So like each of our testimonies even are different. So even in that of aspect, course. the Holy Spirit's equipped us, you know, differently. And I don't think any of them are any better than the other. You know, God just knows that my testimony is effective here. Sarah's testimony is effective here. Rosie's testimony is effective here. And I think the same applies to our witnessing styles. Mic drop. That's very good. <laughs> very, very good. And I think also everyone's capacity for study and for for having giving an answer for the for the for your faith and for the reason for your faith is not the same thing as having the answer for every single type of question that anyone could possibly ask you throughout the entire Life yeah, but you earth. should knock that. We should seek to understand. Constantly. We should do all that we can. However, there there is a difference between we're not called to just know every question that could possibly come at us uh, about their issues with, with faith. We definitely need to be able to give a reason for why we have our faith. And well, I want to know the answers to those questions. Yeah, I'm and just saying. If I have an interest yeah. in those, yeah. If I have an interest for, um, like, why does it say that? And I study, 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 and I assess all the information. I have a better understanding that I am, yes, that comfortable is with. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I get when, that. you know, yeah. yeah. It, you know, just like the whole, like, why was slavery in the Bible when, when I had the, that, that one interview and, and the, there has, there have been so many studies on understanding, um, what that actually means. And yet you will still have unbelievers refute it and refute it and refute it based on the Western interpretation of what that word is. Even right. after you've already explained. That's like a word of knowledge. That's the gift of a word of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's a very important gift. Um, I don't, I, of course, it doesn't necessarily relate completely to that First Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect however the word of knowledge relate, is, a, though. is a big gift because yeah because the gift of knowledge is really important i'm, I'm so i mean it's so wonderful when you when you have the gift of knowledge to absorb the knowledge and be able to just um to be able to relay that knowledge to other people who who are like seeking question questions that they have in their mind about this and about that and the other it's really important i think it's awesome 
Important. Okay, so where you say that they're not related, I would say that it. I didn't say they were not all related. I didn't say they weren't at all related. Obviously, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, you have to do your research to understand why you have the hope that you have. But you're talking about answering their questions on specific I, things. <laughs> Right, that they have questions with and understanding their questions. Right? Am I right? Did I drop? Um, <laughs> sort of, but not really. Sort of, but not really. Because, like, I have a hunger to understand. And that is part of how to love God with all my mind mm -hmm. is to I'm eat it like meat in my mind. To love him with my mind is to understand what exactly he is saying, who exactly he is. Now, you have to take all the scriptures. You have to consume them all. You have to process them all. Allow the Holy Spirit to meditate, meditate, marinate the <laughs> stew within your soul mm -hmm. in order to kind of allow that to grow up into who God is calling you to be to reflect Christ. We're not supposed to just continue to be infants and, right. um, you know, and, and this that well, number one, we have the mind of Christ, which I don't remember exactly where that scripture was. And then there's Acts 20, 27. Um, uh, what is the whole counsel of God? The whole counsel of God is Genesis to Revelation. Keys closed. So how do you do that? How do you grasp the full counsel of God? <laughs> it's almost you have it's like an ev a never ending mm. process. Of, mat of maturity and spiritual growth, committing yourself uh, whenever you can, whenever possible, to your your manna in the morning and and your your meat at night, at the very least, and then your prayers. Um, you know, in order to It is for our benefit that we do that on a daily walk. If you talk, if you look at the Israelites in the wilderness with the manna and the meat, and if they tried to save some of it for later, it would turn into it would rot and turn into maggots. And and that is an example of that daily walk. We are now in the wilderness, and the um, Israelites in the desert were our example of how we are to conduct ourselves as sojourners on this planet, this dying world. Um, and in order to do that, it has, like, God can't just do all the work, and I'm not saying that work save us, but I'm saying that it is to our benefit to press into him daily and understand, like, the whole counsel of God. Yeah, I have a different. The whole counsel of God. I have something right? here. For I, I did some... not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel right. of God. Right. Now I have a something. Go ahead, over. Sarah. The the phrase um the whole counsel of God found in Acts twenty twenty seven. In his farewell speech to the elders of the Ephesian church, Paul says, Therefore I test you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you. The whole counsel of God. Declaring the whole counsel of God is what made Paul innocent of anyone's choice to turn away from the church to truth. He had fulfilled his ministry among the Ephesians. So obviously he only lived a certain amount of time of his life and he studied only a certain amount, you know. But at this point, he spent a certain amount of time with them and said, Boom, I've declared to you the whole counsel of God. I'm innocent from anyone who decides here to turn away from the truth because the whole counsel of God I've basically just given to you. So I don't know that 
it means the whole counsel of God is something the general when it speaks of the whole counsel of God there that it means a kind of counsel of God that just yes we should always be seeking always growing there's always something new to learn but I don't know that that I'll, I'll have to do some research to know if that's what meant there now policy is a Pharisee he is is like in the tribe of Benjamin a Pharisee of Pharisees he knew and he he studied under some of the most prestigious Pharisees and was Just excelling saying, in it Those are his saying that he wasn't talking about that just keep saying that uh -huh. he wasn't saying it just keeps reiterating that the whole counsel of God was like the whole will of God, the whole purpose, and that he had spoke to them the complete gospel, the whole counsel, the whole gospel. He gave them the whole truth about God's salvation. And it also talks about that he revealed to them the mystery the context that context. I can't understand. Paul shared everything that God had revealed with everyone who would listen. I don't know. I'm just reading this, and the whole yeah, council of God is, is used, the, the whole council of God is used as a way to affirm the completion of His duties towards the Ephesians, and to remind them of the truth. So, the whole, I don't know exactly. I'd have to go look at it. What exactly that so far what I'm looking at and reading through is the whole council of God he's saying like I gave it to you and it was just whenever he was with the church of Ephesus obviously he didn't sit there and teach them Torah for you know 10 years to give them the whole council of God so when he says he gave them I've given it to you boom you've got it so it might be might not mean that that's all i'm saying well that? we're kind of even more accountable because back then they didn't have the books mm -hmm. and the gospels weren't even written yet right and like we have dozens not only just like every home at least have one bible but now well, we have we have websites that are devoted yeah to US breaking the information <laughs> down and putting it at our fingertips. Yeah. So and and Daniel no all men are without excuse anyways. So I don't understand what that means when you when you Well, say because that, the scripture though. says no man is with excuse. I understand because Joe's I understand his properties what, through the through his creation. Man will stand no man will stand before him with an excuse that they you know I would just did. like to note that we are going on three oh, hours and five minutes. So if you guys each want to maybe give your closing, I don't want to say arguments because I just feel like it's been a constructive <laughs> conversation. But if you guys want to give your closing thoughts, we can maybe wrap this up in the next five minutes. Okay, I'll go first because Rosie should really close it out because she's the leader. Here, here. I, have, I, I didn't even like process any kind of closing <laughs> do you want to close you want to go last or first Rosie no I don't want to close well I do want to I wanted to read this one thing okay but go go ahead and do your um I guess what I guess my only thought there what I was sharing there why I was sharing that is I agree with Rosie we need to learn all that we can and especially if we have the that fire to understand and it's like a, a depth of knowledge this you know it's a gift in order to you know to reach people that otherwise wouldn't be reached because they they have questions that need to be answered at the same time she's saying that we are without excuse even so we have more of a responsibility because it's very easy to find the answers <laughs> to what you're seeking. Not everyone, of course, because not everyone in the world, obviously we live in America and then the, but in the third world countries, and I don't know if there are fourth world countries and second world countries are not like, not like us. We still, there's still a lot of missionary work needing to be done. 
um in our backyard in our own backyards too because not everybody has three or four bibles at home there are people still without scriptures and don't really know how to search through them at all um and then you have the there's just like a combination of everything even if you're an on an island and his qualities are evident in nature and if you really want to know the creator he's going to reveal himself to you in the way that you will understand whenever mm -hmm. you want to know him he's going to, even without having a bible without having a scripture but if you are capable of having it and you are wanting to understand and you have questions it's very valuable to have somebody who has the word of knowledge very valuable and it's a beautiful ministry and a wonderful very much needed ministry and i really appreciate it everybody's different um special qualities in um advancing the kingdom of god that was a beautiful closing thought sarah yes thank you i appreciate that and i'm just trying to pay forward what has been mercifully or graciously been given to me as I have hungered and thirst. Um, there's certainly, um, you know, um, other members of the body that, um, you know, edify me and they do a better job at it. I'm just trying to, um, you know, you, you get to a certain point <clears throat> and there's the scripture where, where Jesus is, is using the parable of the, the workers in the field and um you know there's there's the ones that you know i get according to what they are able to do uh according to what he gives them you know you have one uh worker he has two talents and he goes and he he does his and he comes back and says you know uh master here i have got given you two here's two more and then you know he gets down to this this last person and this last person says here you uh, here is what you gave me um and i knew you were a, I, I knew you were a um uh, harsh steve you know this one uh, i knew that you were a, a is um yeah the a brutal mind it is is god gave him talents and he hid them away he didn't share them he didn't turn yeah. it into more talents he says at the, you know, that, that one I have really meditated on because I'm like, what does it mean? Put it in the bank. What does that mean? And I really try to understand what that meant. Um, you know, and right here, I mean, I know that this is not what it means, but right here you have the internet. It's the bank. <laughs> Just throw it out there. You know, we're, we're gardeners, we're, we're sowers, we're harvesters, and we all work together and we all rejoice together. And as we're living at the very end, you know, the last minutes of these, you know, final hours is, you know, Daniel 12, 4. Um, but you, Daniel, shut up the words of the and seal the book until the time at the end. Many will roam to and fro and knowledge will increase. Um, I had to actually look that up and it doesn't mean to like drive or travel or air. It, it means that what the roaming to and fro is a seeking for the knowledge. And as they're seeking for that knowledge, that knowledge will increase. And for crying out now, I'm going to and fro at the, the tip, you know, at my fingertips and knowledge will increase. It can't get more prevalent than that. He says, you know, shut up the words of these. Well, why is it that we can understand that so clearly as. Do you hear what do you hear what the rock's cooking? With that. Uh, when was Daniel written? He couldn't have possibly known that it had to be God. And look at us. We can just go to all these Biblehub.com and read the commentaries. Go and touch this word here. What does that word mean in its original context? To much, to, to whom much has been given, much is expected. And I just feel like we're, you know, we're in the end game. You know that movie? I, I, I felt that yesterday. We are in the end game. And we need to be about our father's business because he does not want, you know, we better be about our father's business when he comes.
All right, beautiful closing thoughts. I would like to close us out in prayer, if that's okay with you guys. That would be awesome. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night of fellowship. We thank you, Father, that we live in a country where we don't have to have these kind of meetings in a private basement in fear of being dragged out and imprisoned. Uh, we, we praise you for the fact that we are in a free country where we can share the gospel. And we thank you for the opportunity to be iron sharpening iron, making each other better than we were before. We pray that this fellowship would continue and that you would just make it as fruitful as possible, Father. Strip ourselves away from us and just let us be oracles for you. Let us just speak your truth, Father, and, and what you place on our hearts always. And we just, we are so humbly thankful. Thank you for calling us your children and allowing us to know you. And we just pray that you would bless everyone in this stream, everybody who watches this, that it would touch everyone in some sort of special way. And we ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Christ Jesus, Yeshua Messiah. Amen. Amen. I am Proverbs Guy from the Proverbs Guy official YouTube channel. This is Miss Rosie B from the Push Pray Until Something Happens YouTube channel. And we have Miss Sarah from the Storytime with Sarah, which will soon <laughs> hopefully be another YouTube channel. And we cannot forget She's my Gangster bestest Ghost. girlfriend ever. Oh, <laughs> well, thanks. She called me a brat the other day. <laughs> she, that's, you can say that to your best friend. You know what? <laughs> Don't feel bad, Sarah, because Rosie is always convicting me in my inbox. And like sometimes I'm like, oh, <laughs> stop speaking for the Holy Spirit, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> she really does convict me sometimes. So I, I love the I love the back and forth banter Rosie and I have in our inbox. It's a real brother and sister relationship, and it's been a blessing. Amen. Ready to do my interview or my testimony on your channel um, Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, fun Finally. day. Yeah, so we'll need to get together for that and touch base beforehand. Sounds good. Well, I pray you guys have a wonderful night and God bless all of us. Maranatha and Shalom. God bless you all. Love you. Yeah. Love you too. Okay, bye. <laughs>